In this video, I'm going to talk about precipitation hardening and how that increases the strength of materials. Let's begin by looking at how precipitation hardening takes place. So let's consider that we have some binary AB alloy. And if we are sort of operating in this range over here, if we have a composition that's in this area, this would lead to solid solution strengthening. However, let's say that we sort of uh, held our, heat treated our material with this composition and at this temperature, and then we quenched it. So the concentration stays the same, but we end up now down here in this two-phase region. If we had quenched it, then the solid solution atoms would have stayed, the solute would have essentially stayed distributed in that single phase. And then if we did a heat treatment at this new temperature, slowly the system would equilibrate to allow this phase and this phase to form according to equilibrium, right? So if we look at sort of how that processing would be as a function of time, and temperature, we would heat this up and then we would hold it for some amount of time. And this holding step is the called usually the solution treatment. So that's where we're letting that solid solution form. And then we would quench. And then hold it at some lower temperature for some amount of time. And this is what's called the aging step. And what happens then during aging is that precipitates are forming. And as a function of time, we can consider how they change. So initially, lots and lots of precipitates nucleate, but then they start to sort of uh, grow at one another's expense. So the number of precipitates will decrease in time. The spacing of the precipitates will increase. So we'll start out with lots of them very near together. And then as time goes on, they get further apart and also their size increases. So there's not, the y-axis on here isn't any one thing, but this is just showing the change. And so there will be some sweet spot, essentially, between the size, the spacing, and the sort of volume fraction of the precipitates. So the goal is essentially to have lots of small precipitates which are spaced not too far apart. This is the most effective in impeding dislocation motion. When the precipitates are very small, the dislocations actually cut right through them. So this is the case if the precipitates are small and also if they are coherent with the matrix. And the other option, so the dislocation can cut through, the other option is that the dislocation will basically bow around and that's the case when they are large and or incoherent. And again, that sort of transition is what we're interested in between those two mechanisms. So we'll focus for the rest of this video on the dislocation cutting, so when the particles are small and coherent. And let's start by considering the different contributions to strength that these precipitate particles create. So there are four different ways in which precipitate particles can impede dislocations. The first of these is through size and coherency effects. This is a little bit like solid solution strengthening where we're considering the strain caused in the lattice as a result of having that particle present. The second is the modulus effect, which also is very similar to solid solution strengthening. And this just looks at what is the shear modulus uh, 
of the particle present sort of compared to the lattice. The third is the contribution from interfacial energy or sort of the chemical effect of having um, one phase inside of another phase. And the last depends on the uh, structure of the precipitate particle where if it has an ordered crystal structure and we create an antiphase boundary that additionally increases the energy of the system. So very generally speaking, the strengthening effect from any one of these contributions is given by some constant uh, times the strain contribution of that effect to the three halves times the shear modulus and then times this quantity x where x takes into account the details of the microstructure. So it uh, takes into account basically the size effect and the volume fraction. So R over B, this tells us basically the size of the precipitate relative to the atom size. So B is the Berger's vector and F is the volume fraction. And so remember for solid solution strengthening, we were always concerned about the concentration of the solute particles. This is essentially capturing that same information. So this is a general equation, and we'll, we will now look at each of these four effects more specifically to figure out their contribution to the increase in strength. So the first contribution comes from the coherency, and this is a little bit like the size effect in solid solution strengthening. So I'm showing here we have the sort of matrix material, and we have some second phase precipitate particle and depending on the lattice parameter of the precipitate particle as it compares to the lattice parameter of the matrix, there may be some strain that arises in order to maintain coherency, which is essentially to say this sort of same one-to-one -one bond matching that you would have if the particle weren't there. So the coherency strain is defined as the difference in the lattice parameter of the precipitate as compared to the matrix divided by the lattice parameter of the matrix. So the increase in strength as a result of the coherency strain is given by this expression. You'll notice that we have here the absolute value of the coherency strain and that's because the same effect works whether or not the strain is uh, negative or positive. And then we have uh, what we expect, the shear modulus, and then sort of this term which takes into account the size and volume fraction of the precipitates. So depending on the size effect, so whether this is positive or negative essentially, will tell us whether the dislocation is attracted or repelled. And in either case, whether they're attracted or repelled, it's still interfering with the dislocation motion, thus increasing the strength. Okay, let's look at the second effect. So the second effect is due to differences in modulus between the particle and the matrix. And so we have a modulus effect strain and this is just the difference in the modulus between the particle and the matrix and then normalized by the matrix modulus. And we end up with the contribution to the strength being the following. And again, we have the absolute value of the strain term here because there will be interactions with the dislocation regardless of which is sort of uh, stiffer and which is less stiff. And then again, G and then our usual R, F over B to the one half term. Okay, so let's look at the third contribution, which is the interfacial energy or chemical contribution. <laughs> 
Let's assume that we have a spherical particle and a dislocation which is approaching it. So if the dislocation can cut the particle, cut through it, then as the dislocation gets there, it will leave behind a step of magnitude b, and then the dislocation will be moving through the particle. So here it's in the middle, and as the dislocation continues moving, the particle will essentially get sheared over by one step of b. So the dislocation has now passed through the particle and is continuing on its way, and the particle is sheared by b here and also by b here. In doing this, we have increased the interfacial area between the particle and the matrix, right? So it used to just be a sphere, and now it's essentially two hemispheres, but with this extra interfacial area here. And so we get a contribution to the strain, or to the energy essentially, as a result of this. And so that depends on the interfacial energy and also the size of the particle. So as before, we can then define a strengthening contribution from this, and that looks like the following. So similar form to everything else, only in this case we have this sort of chemical contribution due to the interfacial energy. So let's look at our last contribution to the strengthening as a result of precipitate particles. So let's say that the particle, the precipitate particle has an ordered lattice structure, right? So one of these atoms is the A type and one is B, and this takes on this ordered crystal structure. And now let's say that the dislocation uh, cuts through it. Let's say it cuts through right, right on this line here. And as we saw in the last uh, example, it essentially shears it over by one step B. The result now is that instead of having this sort of checkerboard structure of A, B, A, B, we end up with all of these like atoms touching one another. And this creates what is called an antiphase boundary. This antiphase boundary has some energy associated with it because this is not really how the atoms want to be uh, arranged on the lattice. And so the contribution to the energy is then the antiphase boundary energy. So this is APB. The antiphase boundary energy divided by GB. And so we get a contribution to the overall strength as a result of the increase in energy associated with the antiphase boundary which is this. So this looks really similar to all of the other contributions to strength. So those are the four different contributions, and let's just summarize here. So we have these four different contributions to the strengthening as a result of a precipitate particle, and we should note that this is where the dislocation was going to cut through the particle. And in each of these cases, there were contributions to the energy of the system as a result of either the coherency, the difference in modulus, the interfacial energy, or the creation of antiphase boundary. And in all of these ways, the dislocation interacts differently with the system and its motion is changed. 
and we saw sort of the general uh, general formula that the increase in strength varies in the following way. And we will see then that the, the strengthening that's possible depends very sensitively on the size and the volume fraction of the particles. And we'll look more closely at that in the next video when we also talk about what happens when the dislocations bow around the particles.